Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Randy Hart. I'm with 18F. I'm an acquisitions consulting lead. Um, this is the fifth in our five part series on software development, procurement, and management fundamentals. Um, my focus will be on agile contracting. So I'll tie together some of the things that uh, we've heard in the earlier, earlier modules and talk about how you can apply it when it comes to your solicitations and contracts. In case you haven't seen the other um, parts of the series, the first was agile management, then product ownership, user-centered design, software development practices, and finally this, this part. Um, I encourage you to watch the, the earlier ones because this is they all kind of tie together and they're important to know how um, modern software procurement can happen. Um, real quick, 18F, we are a federal agency within the government. Uh, we were uh, started to try to help agencies to design uh, technology for using best practices for modern software. We share the same motivations as you. Um, we're all feds. Um, we want to help you deliver great service to the public. So a little bit about agile contracting. Um, my background, I've been a career uh, procurement official uh, since 2002. I joined the federal government as contract specialist with the Department of Commerce. Um, I spent years and years uh, writing contracts, mainly for IT systems, um, working with teams, doing the best we could, uh, following standard procurement practices uh, where we, we'd end up not too happy with the results. Um, a lot of times we would end up with something we weren't expecting or unhappy with the vendor or the vendor was unhappy with us. And it was just kind of a, a struggle every day. And I joined 18F about six years ago in an attempt to um, help them when I saw that they were trying to help agencies try to think of different ways to procure software. Uh, I've worked with a lot of different states and um, federal agencies, and we see common, um, common issues occurring. And we wrote something called the de-risking guide, um, which uh, if you Google 18 at de-risking guide, it'll come up. Uh, they kind of, kind of try to capture what we've been learning and try to try, try to distill it into one document so folks can have something to look at uh, as they try to think of ways to improve the way they're, they're doing their digital procurements. So my background, like I said, I was a contracting officer with the Census Bureau, and this was what my procurement process normally looked like. It would take years to kind of gather the requirements, write an RFP, it would take maybe a year or more to, to run the actual solicitation and procurement process. We'd wait two or three years for the vendor to produce something. And in the end, we weren't happy with it. Um, that was kind of common, unfortunately, but it wasn't just in my agency. I'm finding that it was throughout government. We, we experienced similar problems. And I'm also finding out it happens in, in the outside world as well. So we're not alone in this. Um, this, is, this is a common thing. And what we're trying to do is just think about ways we can uh, shift the risk and, and change that approach in some ways that will help us uh, meet the user needs. Oops, wrong way. Uh, that approach, these are just some headlines. I worked with Medicaid uh, within CMS. Um, states were finding similar things happening in Medicaid, but it happens in, in throughout government. Um, and these are some of the headlines we saw. This isn't the pinpoint these states because this is a common issue. And it's because of the risk involved with the, the waterfall approach that we took. Um, you heard Lindsay and others talk about waterfall versus agile. And what we're trying to do is shift our procurements to be more agile and adapt change better. So I want to tell, talk about two different contracts that I was involved with. The first was when I was at the Census Bureau. Um, and I'll talk about kind of what we went through, what happened, and, and what how we had to deal with what happened. And the second one is one that I, uh, with the tax court, uh, we worked with the tax court when I was with 18F and I wanna talk about the procurement we went through with them and how we did it differently and wound up with vastly different results. So for census, I worked on something called the field data collection automation, FITCA contract for the 2010 census. Um, it was intended to automate all the field operations. So there's 500,000 people throughout the country and, and territories that go around door to door and knock on the door if you haven't filled in your census and try to collect that information. And the idea was that we would 
automate those processes through what we called a handheld computing device. This was before iPhones or anything else. Our contract called for the vendor to develop a handheld computing device. That was one of the requirements um, there where they could capture the information on the handheld, transmit it to the regional office, which would send it back to headquarters. There was a lot involved. There was, it was a, a, a lofty idea, lofty goals for what we were hoping to do. Um, the strategy and concept was, was developed and before I started at Census, but it uh, kind of got underway in the late 90s. Uh, the budget was approved in 2001. Um, our requirements gathering began in 2002. And that was uh, what, you, what you heard in an earlier module about user-centered design. What we did was what I would call headquarters-centered design, which is not what you want to do. Um, basically, where we would go to the, the field, the regional offices, or we in headquarters, we would say, what does the system have to do? What do we think it has to do in 2010, knowing what we know now in 2002? And let's make sure we get it all down on paper. Um, that led to an RFP that was thousands of pages, um, and thousands of pages of mainly requirements that I don't think anybody could read uh, fully and really comprehend or digest. But that was our, our goal was to write that everything down that we could think of so that we could hold the contractor accountable for, for meeting those requirements. We issued the RFP in 2004, so it was about two years of writing and, and gathering these requirements, a lot of sessions to, to do that. Uh, we issued the RFP in 2004. <clears throat> we ultimately awarded a contract in 2006. Uh, the contract went to a single vendor um, for $600 million after getting, there were about eight com companies that were involved in the, the procurement process, but we ultimately selected one awarded for six million, $600 million in 2006. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but this is kind of an example of what our file room looked like for this. Maybe, it was maybe half the size, but for one contract. So that was, that first row you can imagine would be just the solicitation itself. So that was all the requirements we could think of, all the standard operating procedures we could write down, everything we could think of we wrote, put in the RFP, um, the next two rows would be the proposals. We asked for thousands of pages and proposals that no one could have humanly read. Um, that the proposals, we required them to have plans for plans. We had to have when they were going to have their proposal, their, their system design, when they were going to have detailed schedule for everything that was going to happen for the next four years after 2006 in order to reach the go live date in 2010. Obviously, that was planning for a lot of unknowns, but we thought or you know our approach was to try to make them known through our requirements process and the next probably four rows were modifications change proposals letters from us to the vendor uh, there was a lot of back and forth with the vendor um, because in 2008 the vendor told us that what we already knew the requirements have changed and that's something that we probably we probably, we did know when we were doing the requirements gathering, but uh, the vendor let us know that uh, the requirements have changed so significantly that they would need um, a, a replan of the entire system in order to meet the requirements as they now knew them. Um, same time, our stakeholders were coming in saying, uh, why are you building these handheld computing devices? I've got an iPhone now. Um, there was iPhones, Blackberries, there were all kinds of things out there. Why are, the, why are you having a vendor go and produce these handheld computing devices? Why did you even call it that? All second guessing what we had thought we knew back in 2002 through 2004. Good questions, but the fact was because we used that waterfall planning, we had to write down what, what the requirements, what our plan was up front, and we didn't know the iPhone, what it was. Um, so we, we couldn't account for that change in technology or the change in user needs. So again, our response to that change, um, the, the, re the proposal came in at $1.3 billion uh, for the, in changes. So on top of the $600 million in order for them to fix the software, fix the handheld computing devices so that they would meet the new requirements. Uh, this was hardcore negotiation, not collaboration from the beginning. We had maybe a month or two of honeymoon period with the vendor, but it was very quickly apparent to, to both parties 
that this was going to be a gnarly project and the plans that we had all spent so much time writing down and spent so much effort on, they weren't going to hold up. Um, it was because we used that big traditional acquisition approach with the thousands of pages because our requirements, we had invested so much time and energy into writing them that there was so much, so much, uh, some cost in there that the, the idea of changing those things was just something that you know all the various stakeholders just couldn't couldn't get their heads around or, uh, because there was so much invested already we were measuring in our contract through through the acquisition approach we were measuring things that really didn't mean much when it came to actual objectives or success criteria we measure things like lines of code that had been written or you know have they delivered this design document by this date you know a lot of it was around demonstrating they were making progress through um, memos. So, so we were asking for memos around what the, was going on without anything tangible that we could actually use or test until it was too late. And ultimately it was, we, we had to face the fact that it was a $600 million project that wouldn't be able to meet any of the, the milestones that we had thought we could meet back in 2003, four timeframe. By 2008, it was, it was obvious to everyone that we weren't gonna get there. We did end up salvaging it. Um, it's it's a question that comes up quite often. Well, how do you shift from a, a waterfall contract to this different way of doing things? And the answer is it's not easy. There's no silver bullet. It takes a whole lot of work, a lot of political will, um, a lot of, of wrangling, um, and a lot of hurt feelings. You know, when when you have something this big that's been planned this hard, uh, and you have to shift, there is there's a lot of daggers that are out um, because no one wants to be the one held holding the bag at the end. The idea in government a lot of times is if you contract out for it, you've outsourced the risk. And so now it's on the vendor and if it doesn't work, that's on them and you can claw back money or something like that. But in the end, that doesn't help anybody in the situation because ultimately you have a mission and being able to win in lawsuits, which doesn't normally happen. Normally, if there's a termination, that it's it's very hard to to claw back through termination um, funding or anything else, and even if you get the money back, it's a good thing for taxpayers. But uh, in the end, you don't meet your mission, and you're left with with sore feelings on both sides. So we salvaged it by descoping a lot of the work, um, a lot of turnover on the vendor side, a lot of turnover on the government side, uh, a lot of leadership changes. Um, but it took a whole lot of work. And um, it's not somewhere I would want to go back to. So how can you avoid that risk and deliver better? That's what we're trying to do at 18F. And that's what a lot of agencies are trying to do. What is something we can do besides that big waterfall RFP? An example of this is the, the US courts, the US tax court contract. We helped them out in 2018. Um, after trying a few different iterations of this, we, we had a pretty good thing with the tax courts. Um, they had a system that wasn't quite near, it wasn't as vast as the, the 2010 census, but it was big. It was tax courts are basically, if you have a problem with what the IRS is finding in, in their audits, or if you have anything you want to sue the IRS over, you go to the U.S. tax courts to, to make your case. They have about 25,000 people. Um, that file cases each year. And their system had over about a million case files that were held in its legacy system. Um, quickly, quick note about their legacy system. It was built in 1982 under a contract and they had had the sole source with this vendor since 1982 because everything depended on that sole vendor to do their case management system. Obviously something built in 1982 wasn't working very well in 2018, but they were completely uh, beholden to that vendor. And we see that a lot in agencies. And, and I experienced a lot when I was with, with other agencies before 18F, where everything's built in this black box of a proprietary system, whether you call it COTS or whatever else, and they hold it. And then you have to just keep renewing with that vendor because everything is in that basket. So they were in a real bind where they had all of their information in that old system. They wanted to build a new modern system for, for case management and they had to do that. Um, their thought was to do it the way that I had done this 20th census contract, but it, a lot of people do it where they issued a request for information saying, 
help us gather requirements, help us to define exactly what the plan is and give us your feedback. And we, I, I saw the RFI, we responded to the RFI and said, please wait, wait until before you do that. Let us come talk to you about maybe a trying different approach. And, and they took us up on it. And ultimately we issued a, a request for quote. Uh, that's what you call it if you use the GSA schedule, um, which is kind of a, a pre-approved list of vendors that, that GSA has that, that can do government business. And there's some good, good vendors on there. Uh, we issued a request for quote on, in August of 2018. Um, we ran through the solicitation and the proposal process, got, a, I think, 10 bids, and we awarded a contract in September of 2018. So contrast that with what, what I showed you with my experience at Census. We could do that in a short amount of time because, number one, it was less funding, and we were talking about $2 million a year for one team to, to start the work on the project. But number two, we just weren't asking for the world in the, in the RFP. We, we knew and assumed change from the beginning, and that was that played out in the RFP process. I'll share a link to that, that RFQ, and I'll, we'll go through it in a, in a few, few minutes. Um, some of the other differences, there wasn't requirements gathering. There was a statement of objectives in the RFP, in the RFQ. Uh, so basically, instead of saying we need to know exactly what the system is that's being going to be built, we said we have an objective for this, this system to manage cases, and we have these people that are going to have cases, and we didn't try to nail down exactly what the people were, exactly what they were going to do. We just said we need someone to help us at, at the tax court build a system for case management that was going to make it easier for the users, and we defined the user personas, and we defined who they would be and how they would interact, but we didn't try to say they will hit this button or they will do this exact thing. We said, here's our vision for what the thing is gonna do. Come and tell us how you're gonna work in an agile way and tell us how you're gonna meet those objectives without having to nail down everything in your proposal about exactly what the solution was gonna be. We also, again, the RFQ was only 20 pages versus hundreds and hundreds of pages. The proposals were 10 pages. We got enough out of those 30 pages total, our RQ being 20, proposals being 10, to know how the vendor was gonna approach the work and have enough confidence to award a contract without a protest. Like I said, the, the contract, the RFP itself was open to change, it was leaner. It was vastly less documentation. That doesn't mean that we didn't require documentation as the vendor that won the work did the work but it was different kind of documentation. It was around how, why they built the system the way they built it. It was what user research, the continuous user research, what they were learning, how they were shifting the way they were building. It was documenting the user stories that, that they were, were developing on. Things that were real tangible to building working software for the users. Those, that's the kind of documentation we had. And we had them documented in a way that others could pick it up and, and run with it. So we weren't completely beholden to that vendor. It was all built in open source. Instead of buying a solution or a set thing for requirements, we bought a team that would work in this way, that cross-functional team of designers and developers, some product management experts. Um, we, we talked about not just what the, the objectives were, but we told them how we were going to measure quality. And that was things like I talked about where what does tangible quality look like when it comes to building software. We had a paragraph in there about how that had to adapt to cer when circumstances change. We knew and we assumed up front that things were going to change. And we asked the vendors to propose a team that would have practices that would allow them to evolve with the change. And again, it was $2 million a year because we wanted just a small team to get them used to working in this way so that they could build, uh, build the beginning and the foundations of it so that others could build on top of it after they really got used to building this new product in this new way. That, that reducing the cost really reduced the risk because there wasn't so much riding on it and it gave a lot more leeway to the team to make changes as they went without so much riding on what was going to be a belt. There wasn't that big go live date staring everybody down. It was very much thought of as a, we're going to learn and we're going to grow the product as we learn. So I wanted to try to quickly go through the RFQ example with, with you. Um, 
me pull it up here. Just to show you a little bit about what it is, and I'll share a link at the end of this to the RFQ. It's it's available online for if you want to borrow it. Uh, let's see. We post it all on something called GitHub. Uh, that's kind of like a Facebook sort of thing for software developers. Um, but we posted it there just so that they could see that we were going to run a completely open, transparent procurement process. Um, here is the RFQ itself. As you can see, it was uh, released August 2nd and responses were due August 24th. We could do that three week turnaround because we also posted a draft on GitHub as well and asked for comment and feedback on that draft about a month prior to issuing the final. So the vendors could really understand and ask questions around the approach and what it was that our objectives were. Here's the table of contents. As you can see, it's 20 pages. Um, the, the statement of work really talks about, it gave a history on their legacy system, that it's non-web-based, operates through desktop. Um, we gave, we did give a one appendix that showed kind of the processing workflow so the vendors could see the users and how they interacted with the current system, not saying they had to, obviously the system might, they might change some of the workflows, but we wanted to give them context around what, the way the case management system was working. Um, we talked mainly about how we wanted them to work. So we wanted them to be involved with um, robust documentation, human-centered design. We wanted them to have an extensible infrastructure. Uh, we wanted the, the development process to be collaborative and iterative with open, regular, and frequent communication between the court and the contractor. So this, this was something that we were um, in the proposals themselves. And we also had um, interviews with all of the vendors we wanted to hear how they were going to communicate because we wanted the tax court wanted to get away from the black box situation. They wanted to have that constant back and forth and kind of see it as a team working together between the government and the vendor. We talked about two week sprint cycles versus months and months to do the different phases of a waterfall plan. So, um, we talked, we, in an earlier module, we talked about the importance of a product owner and, and the court, we uh, worked with the court to build up the skills of the product owner and get them ready for taking ownership of, of the direction, the priorities of the product. Uh, we, we let the vendor know up front that the court was going to be the person that's setting the direction and making those choices. So the vendor knew that the government was going to maintain that control as the work was being done. Um, and then we talked about how we wanted one development team. Um, we thought it was really important that we start with one team because we wanted the court to get used to this culture change that goes with the agile contracting. Um, and so we thought starting with one team, we, we figure with $2 million budget, it would be between five and nine people. And that, that is what we ended up with from the vendor that won. Um, when it came to requirements, uh, as you can see, there, this was the extent of it versus hundreds of pages of requirements. We just required that they use these things that may be, I don't know, may, may sound like a foreign concept to folks like, like myself that aren't technical, but these are the things that are important for modern software. It had to incorporate application programming interfaces. It had to be dynamically allocated computing resource, meaning it had to be cloud-based. I think that's what it means but it was cloud-based. Um, we talked about how it has, had to have user authentication of authorization. Um, we didn't say exactly what they would do to get those things. We, we knew that we weren't, weren't going to be able to nail all that stuff down right now. We just put them on, on notice that that was what the expectation or, or the requirement. Um, Software requirements, again, this is one paragraph. Software architecture must be extensible to allow for future development. Code base must incorporate analytics, monitoring, continuous integration, and measurement tools. The things that Greg talked, to, will, talked about in his module about so, modern software um, development, we just required that they follow those, those, those practices. And then the environments, again, this is where we talk about cloud. It has to be hosted in the cloud. So basically we said it's a case management system. It has to meet these very standard, but modern practices. And that's how we expect you to approach the work in an agile way. 
And then we talk about how we're gonna measure the work after it's awarded. And this is, these are the things that are around, like I said, tangible, what does good working software look like? It's tested, it's properly styled, it's accessible, it's deployed, meaning when they deliver their code every two weeks, it has to be able to successfully build and deploy into a staging environment. We weren't gonna wait months and months and months before we tried to test out and see if it would go and deploy because that's what leads to the headaches that we, we see throughout government where there's so much waiting for that deployment. There's so much churn and, and concern when it comes time to hit the deploy button. We wanted to get used to having it deployed every two weeks. We wanted the vendors to build it in that way. Documentation, again, uh, being agile doesn't mean it's not documented. It just means it's documented as it's needed to be documented so that others can see what the dependencies are so others can take it and run with it. Um, a really important point to agile contracting is to, to make sure that the thing that's being built, others can build on top of it. Obviously there will be a learning curve if somebody has to take it and, and build off it, but we, we still need to see it as it's being built so that anybody can see why it was built the way it was built. And if there's problems, they can go back to where the problems occurred relatively easily and then secure. Um, we built security in from the beginning. We asked the vendor to include a security expert so that we didn't have to wait until it was time to, to deploy like, like we have in the past and then run into a lot of security problems. They built in some of the best practices uh, with a security expert as part of that cross-functional team. And finally, the last part is we started with uh, some preliminary user stories. Now this took about a week or so for us to um, get together and do some facilitated experts with uh, designers on our team to think through who were the users were and how they would um, be interacting with the system. But an important point here is right here, this, this paragraph, the set of, at, the, at the very top, the set of preliminary user stories will be the starting point for the development of software. These user stories are provided only for illustrative purposes and do not comprise the full scope or detail of the project. That paragraph right there is what's really important because that says these are given for context reasons. These aren't meant to be the final requirements. These are to give you context vendors about what we think the users are going to be and what we think the user stories are going to be that are going to be the beginning of the development work. This is the, the, the main difference between that waterfall approach of trying to get everything down up front and instead shifting to the, the idea that things are going to change and, and accepting that and having the vendors be ready to make those changes and, and use an approach that'll allow for it. Again, we said the contractor will work closely with the product owner to perform user research, pre prepare user personas and develop and prioritize a full gamut of user stories as the project progresses. They'll work closely with the product owner and the government side. So again, this is the ownership isn't just punting it all to the vendor and saying, go work on it and come back to us with a final product. It, it does require skin in the game from the government side to make sure that the government is helping prioritize, helping make decisions as, as the work is being done. And these are just the basic um, user stories we put out just to help them understand the, the way the work the way the users would interact with the system. So as a pro se petitioner, I need to initiate a case by following an electronic petition so I can seek resolution of my dispute with the IRS. That's basically the way the users are gonna to have to interact with the system. Now, as work goes on, those will be broken down into, you know, the, the work that the designers do and the developers to make those into actual working software, but this is the starting point for them to do that work. For, um, for the proposals themselves, as you can see here, we asked for a te technical proposal of no more than four pages, a staffing plan of no more than three pages, and references to one or more source code samples. That was the extent of the, the proposals. And we could see from that how they would approach the technical work, how they, their team would be staffed, and how they've done that in the past. We could look at their actual uh, samples where they've done this work in the past. And that was enough to give us as evaluators a sense of how they approach the work and 
that was all we needed in order to make an, a decision on, on which vendor to, to select. Um, we go into a little bit more detail around what should be in those things, but it, at, at its most basic level, it's how do you approach the work and how are you gonna staff your team? Uh, these are the elements we look for in the staffing plan. And th these are kind of the, just a bolded list of all the things that we've gone through in the previous sessions around modern software practices. We did have interviews and I highly encourage that if you can work that into your procurement process where we would have the vendors that were uh, considered the most highly rated for their uh, initial written proposals. We asked them to come in and do an interview just like we would if it was a, somebody you were hiring for a job. And that really gave you a sense of how the team dynamic worked and how they, how it wasn't just what was written down, it was how they actually were gonna approach the work. And that really helped us gain confidence in who we were gonna make the award to. Ultimately, like I said, it was a two month process and I am going to pull up, it's still in production or yeah, okay, good, it's still in production. Uh, this is the system itself. I wish I had a screenshot of what the old system looked like, but if you can imagine something that was built and developed in 1982, that's what it looked like. It, 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 was, it was pretty gnarly. It looked like one of those old, I don't know, um, whatever the first web browsers were, that's what it looked like. This is a new one. Um, as you can see, you can go in and you can register. It's called Dawson. They named it after the one of the uh, chief, uh, chief judges. Um, but you can register for Dawson. You can file a petition. You can manage your own cases. You can search for cases and documents. There's reference materials. It's all written in, in plain language. Um, so you don't have to be an expert to go in. They, they, part of their team was to bring on a content uh, person that was going to be able to make things as plain language as possible. And it's not always possible, but they, they try their best to make it as plain language as possible for how to prepare and fill out your, your forms. So we ended up after, you know, instead of spending the years and years in the procurement process, this took a couple of months. The vendor came on. They started doing the work. The vendor and the tax court got used to working together. And ultimately they, they produced something that was easy to use. And, and ultimately they don't have to pay that old contractor from 1982 anymore. So that's an example of the way this work can go if you approach, um, if you approach the work differently. Um, that's not to say that this, just writing a different RFP is going to be the, the fix all because there's a lot of culture change involved. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of other things you need to learn. Like you, you need to get used to the idea of product management versus project management. You have to get used to the idea of communicating and collaborating differently with vendors, but it is possible. And, and a lot of the pressure comes off of, there was so much pressure on us at this, during the census days of trying to make sure that everything was nailed down in the beginning. If you take that pressure off and you say, we're not, we accept we're not gonna nail it all down, but we wanna have this collaborative contract with a vendor that puts you all in a better, much better spot. We're hoping to have a, uh, some office, office hours or Q and A session with, with folks that are interested. I'd love to dive in with you all on any questions you have. I know a lot of this kind of went fast and was a kind of a surface level. But there's a lot of lessons we've learned, and I'd, I'd love to uh, be able to share what we've learned and some of the tricks we've, we've learned as we've uh, shifted our practices. Thanks, and uh, we'll hope to see you there.